Um, so, in general, a basis can be any such collection of, of vectors, but um, there is um, an important way to represent a basis called an orthonormal basis. So an orthonormal basis has the property that um, if I have uh, an orthonormal basis a hat 1, a hat 2, and so on up to a hat b, all linearly independent, an orthonormal basis has the following two properties. Uh, for one thing, all of the um, all of the basis vectors are orthogonal to each other. So a hat one dot uh, a hat i dot a hat j is equal to zero for all i not equal to j. And the other property, so that's orthogonal. The other property is normal, which means the norm of a hat i equals one. All of these basis vectors are length one, and they're all orthogonal to each other. So that's like our usual n-dimensional basis. Um, let's call this one zero 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 one zero zero one. So in three dimensions, any vector can be represented as a linear combination of those three. And we uh, last time, so again, uh, I'm going through this very quickly because it should be review from last time. Uh, we talked about the example of the Cartesian, um, the Cartesian vector space, which is which looks like this. All these three, um, these three basis vectors are all orthogonal to each other, and they're all obviously of length one. So why is this important? Um, it turns out that the orthonormal basis, when we get back to signals, um, the orthonormal basis will describe um, basically our set of uh, matched filters. So when we have uh, multiple dimensions in the signal space, in other words, um, each signal can be represented as a linear combination of some basis, what we're going to do is we're going to provide a matched filter for each basis vector. So if you think back to uh, what we were doing with um, um, binary signals, we had S0 and S1. S1 was a, a linear multiple of S0, and we had a matched filter with respect to S0. So we're going to do something similar here. So we're going to have um, um, any um, signal we will be able to represent um, as a, a linear combination of some d-dimensional basis, actually uh, we won't get beyond two dimensions, so we'll be able to represent any signal in two dimensions. So in other words, some coefficient times alpha A1 and some coefficient times A2. Then we'll have two match filters, one match to A1, one match to A2, and those filters will pick off the coefficients in the A1 direction and the A2 direction. And we will use those to decide. Okay, one, this is, where, this is basically where I stopped last time, uh, just as a review of uh, vector spaces. One more thing that I want to talk about, and that is, uh, if you have, let's say, two vectors, which are not necessarily orthonormal, how do you get an orthonormal basis? So it's just, it's fine if I give you an orthonormal basis, then you can obviously express any, um, any uh, vector in the vector space as a, as a linear combination of that basis. Um, but how do you, um, how do you, um, if, if I give you uh, two vectors and I say that these span a vector space, how do you get the orthonormal basis? Uh, that is called orthonormalization. Which is called the Gram-Schmidt procedure. So for our purposes, we're only going to be dealing with two dimensions. Um, so here's what it looks like in two dimensions. If I have uh, vectors A and B, A 
given vectors a and b, find um, uh, find the orthonormal basis. A hat and B hat for the vector space B span by A and B. So in other words, if A and B, um, if A and B can be used to span a vector space, in other words, any vector in a particular space can be written as a linear combination of A and B. How do I get an orthonormal basis from those two? So that's pretty easy. It turns out in two dimensions, it's very easy. First, you normalize A. In other words, you take you take A as your first basis vector. That makes sense. Uh, they're all linear linearly independent, so it doesn't really matter where you start, so we can start with A. And we can say uh, A hat is equal to A divided by the norm of A. So in other words, uh, A has a certain length, and we're going to divide all the components of A by its length, and that will shrink its length to 1. So in other words, the norm of a hat is equal to the norm of the vector a divided by its norm. Uh, this 1 over norm of a comes out, and you get norm of a divided by norm of a is 1, so therefore we just shrank the length to 1. The second thing we do is remove component of B in the direction of A. Either a or a hat. Um, what's the component of b in the direction of a hat? How do I find that? B dot b dot a hat. So this is b dot a hat. So in other words, remember my diagram like this. Here's a hat. A hat is an orthonormal vector, so it's a vector of length one. Basically, B is made up with a component uh, in the direction of A hat, and a component that's orthogonal to that. And the length of this is B dot A hat, which is equal to norm B, uh, the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. So therefore, we take, uh, let's call it B prime, is equal to B minus B dot A hat. So now I'm just left with, if I take out b dot a hat, I'm just left with the component that's orthogonal. And then finally, normalize um, b prime. So b hat is equal to, I just take this vector and make its length 1. Prime divided by norm b prime, which is equal to um, b minus b dot a hat 